Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Understanding Preemption, What It Is, How It Works, and How to Respond. We're excited that you're all able to join us today. I'm Pratima Musburger, and I'm a Program Director and Senior Staff Attorney at Change Lab Solutions. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. I'd like to start out with a few housekeeping announcements. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for download from our website in about a week. Also, all participant lines have been muted. If you have a question for one of our presenters, please feel free to type the questions into the chat box on the lower left corner of the screen. We will try to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If we run out of time and haven't answered all of the questions that we receive, we will contact you via email with a response to your question. Today's webinar will consist of two presentations followed by Q&A. I would like to begin by briefly introducing our two presenters. We're honored to have them with us today. Our first presenter will be Derek Carr, Staff Attorney at Change Lab Solutions. Derek's presentation is entitled Preemption 101. He will be providing attendees with a basic understanding of the legal concept of preemption and discussing the arguments in favor of and the potential problems that may stem from preemption. Our next presenter will be Lindsay Freitas, who is the Senior Director of Advocacy at the American Lung Association in California Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing. Lindsay's presentation is entitled, Recent Preemption Losses and How to Prepare. She will be discussing how communities can respond if threatened with preemption. After the two presentations, we will have time for Q&A, and I will be serving as the moderator. Before we get started with the presentations, I'd like to say a few words about Change Lab Solutions. Change Lab Solutions is a nonprofit based out of Oakland, California. Our mission is to create healthier communities for all through better laws and policies. Change Lab Solutions has been at the forefront of tobacco control initiatives for over 20 years by providing tailored support to communities as they use the tools of law and policy to regulate where and how tobacco products are marketed, used, and sold. And now just a quick disclaimer. The information provided in this webinar is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. Change Lab Solutions does not enter into attorney-client relationships. So with that, I would like to once again thank our presenters for their participation in today's webinar and for sharing their expertise with us. I would now like to turn it over to our first presenter, Derek Carr. Thank you, Pratima. In this Preemption 101 presentation, we're going to cover some of the basics on the structure of government and regulatory authority, including, of course, what preemption is and how it works. Some of you are probably already familiar with these concepts, while for others, they may, this may be the first time that you're learning about preemption. My goal is to establish a shared understanding of various concepts and terminology and how these apply to policymaking generally and tobacco control specifically. We'll start with a refresher on federal, state, and local authority, including the sources from which each level of government derives its authority. And I apologize in advance if anyone has bad flashback to their high school civics class. Next, we'll discuss what preemption is before moving on to the different types of preemption and the circumstances under which each type can either help or hinder efforts to protect public health and advance health equity. Finally, we'll look at how preemption has played out historically in the tobacco control landscape. Lindsay's presentation a little bit later will cover some of the more recent events related to preemption and tobacco control. So let's jump in. When a government sets out to address a problem like increasing access to safe, affordable housing or reducing access to tobacco products, it first must ask what it has the legal authority to do. As we all know, government authority in the United States, including all authority related to public health regulation, is divided among federal, state, and local government. The primary source for this authority is the U.S. Constitution. Under the Constitution Supremacy Clause, federal law takes precedent over lower level laws. It states that this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bind, bound thereby, 
anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. Now, this is a bunch of legalese and 18th century legalese at that. But in essence, this means that if a state or local law conflicts with federal law, federal law, the quote-unquote supreme law of the land, supersedes the state or local law because they're a lower level. However, it's really states and local governments that have the most power to pass laws to protect public health. Under the Constitution, states have all the powers that are not reserved for the federal government. This is what's commonly referred to as the police power. The U.S. Constitution reserves police powers, those which form the basis for most public health policy, to states. And this reservation of authority to states, it's what's referred to as a plenary power, meaning that states have nearly unlimited discretion in choosing how much, if any, of this power they will share with local governments. In other words, while the Constitution is a source of state police powers, local governments must rely on states for their authority. And the degree to which local governments have autonomous powers barely, varies greatly by state. California, in particular, is what's known uh, as a strong home rule state, meaning that local governments in California are generally permitted to pass any law so long as it does not conflict with state or federal law, conflict with the state or federal constitution, or regulate in an area that has been preempted. And today, local governments are often leaders in efforts to improve health and advance health equity. However, when working in communities, particularly underserved communities, it's important to remember that the mechanisms that local governments now rely on to innovate and protect public health were historically used as a means to combat reconstruction and civil rights. So local control really has different connotations in different communities, and we as public health professionals must acknowledge and address this history in our work. Of course, this doesn't mean that local authority is a bad thing. The work of local government is vitally important. Local governments are often closer and more responsive to the populations affected by policy decisions and can be more responsive to community concerns. They can also drive innovative policies that would be difficult or impossible to pass at a higher level of government. In California especially, robust local authority has been pivotal to the tobacco control movement. Almost every major innovative tobacco control regulation, from secondhand smoke protections to Tobacco 21, started at the local level. Maintaining local government authority is thus critical to ensuring that California can continue its progress towards a tobacco-free future. And this is why we all need to know about and care about preemption. So what is preemption? At its core, preemption is when the law of a higher jurisdiction limits or even eliminates the power of a lower level of government to regulate a certain issue. This can take the form of the federal government invalidating a state or local law or a state government invalidating a local law. Generally, a government cannot do anything that conflicts with a higher level of government law. Depending on the type of preemption, however, lower levels of government may also be prevented from passing any laws on a certain issue, or they might be prevented from passing certain types of laws affecting that issue. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the forms preemption can take and what they mean. Preemption takes many forms, and it's not inherently partisan or universally negative. Whether preemption has a positive or negative effect depends on how it's used and the type of preemption in question. In terms of how different types of preemption affect the ability of local governments to take cer certain action, there are three broad categories, each with their own costs and benefits. First, there is ceiling preemption. Ceiling preemption occurs when a higher level of government establishes regulations and prohibits lower levels of government from enacting additional regulations or restrictions. Ceiling preemption can be thought of as setting maximum standards. Second, there is floor preemption. In many ways, floor preemption isn't really even preemption at all. Instead, floor preemption is best understood as when a higher level of government 
sets minimum standards that local governments can go beyond but can't fall below. And finally, there's vacuum or null preemption. And this is where a higher level of government doesn't establish any regulations of its own, but still prohibits lower levels of government from taking action to address a particular matter. So what are the costs and benefits of ceiling preemption? Ceiling preemption ensures that there are uniform standards applicable across the board. This avoids what's often referred to as a patchwork regulatory scheme, where the rules differ depending on each community. And uniformity can make things more efficient. After all, if there's only one set of rules, it's easier to make sure that you're complying with them. In a moment, we'll talk about an example where uniform standards and efficiencies benefit public health. However, by setting maximum standards, you're also limiting flexibility. We all know that a policy may work in one community, but not another community. Ceiling preemption prevents local governments from tailoring policies to meet the needs of their specific communities. It can also stifle innovation because communities are not able to test the effectiveness of different policies, making it harder to establish an evidence base and preventing the policies from diffusing to higher levels of government. One example of ceiling preemption is airline safety regulations. Because we don't want pilots worrying about what standards and regulations might apply as they cross state lines in the air, it seems most logical and efficient to regulate airline safety at the federal level and not to allow states or local government to enact different laws. And that's exactly what we do. Airline safety is regulated by the federal government and state and localities are preempted from enacting laws in this area. In contrast, ceiling preemption doesn't make as much sense in the context of minimum wage laws. To draw on a personal example, I currently live in Oakland, which is, as many of you are aware, one of the most expensive housing markets in the country. But I grew up in North Carolina, where the cost of living is much lower. A minimum wage that might have been sufficient in North Carolina won't provide the same level of support in Oakland because of conditions unique to the particular communities. And this not only happens between different states, but also within a single state. For example, the cost of living in San Francisco is significantly higher than the cost of living in more rural parts of the state. In this case, any benefits to uniformity are greatly outweighed by the inability to tailor policies that meet the needs of individual communities. As I mentioned earlier, the second type of preemption, floor preemption, isn't really preemption at all. Floor preemption simply sets minimum standards upon which local governments can build on. This approach has a number of advantages and relatively few drawbacks. Local authority allows the flexibility to tailor policies to fit a community's needs and values, and local authority can also foster innovation. State and local governments are sometimes called the quote-unquote laboratories of democracies because they can test or refine policy ideas. And local authority creates an environment that allows the development of innovative policies by testing them on a smaller scale. And with innovative policies comes the opportunity to drive policy change more broadly and encourage progress in areas that are unsettled because the science is still evolving or policymakers are still understanding what works. School nutrition standards provide one example of floor preemption. The federal government has established certain minimum standards for the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Program, and federal law preempts weaker or conflicting state and local laws. However, state and local governments can establish more rigorous requirements for school meals, such as by further reducing the amount of saturated fat or sodium allowed. They could also expand the scope of the requirements by, for example, prohibiting the sale of any food or beverage product on school grounds that does not meet established nutrition standards. Federal law thus establishes baseline protections that apply nationwide, but allows state and local governments to provide additional protections. Civil rights laws are another area where states may go beyond federal law and in many states where local governments may go beyond state law. For example, Title VII of the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits employment discrimination on, among other things, the basis of sex, 
including discrimination on the basis of pregnancy. Some states, like California, have gone much further and require employers to provide greater pregnancy benefits than what is required by federal law. In a court case challenging the California statute requiring employers to grant leave for pregnant employees, the California Court of, Expe of Appeals explained that Congress intended to construct a floor beneath which pregnancy disability benefits may not drop, not a ceiling above which they may not rise. And in June 2011, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Math, known at the time then as the Institute of Medicine, addressed the role of preemption in public health. They concluded that higher level governments should, wherever appropriate, set minimum standards that allow lower level governments to further protect the health and safety of their inhabitants, and that preemption should avoid language that hinders public health action. A number of other public health organizations have taken similar positions that states and the federal government should employ floor, not ceiling preemption in the overwhelming majority of cases. In addition to floor and ceiling preemption, there's a third type of preemption called vacuum or null preemption. This occurs when legislators choose not to establish regulations in a particular field, but then actively forbid lower level of government from doing so. This typically happens on the state level and therefore most often affects local government authority. Here you can see a map of the states highlighted in orange that as of February 2016 have laws preempting local policies related to food and nutrition. These states include Arizona, Utah, Wisconsin, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. Depending on the states, Local governments may be preempted from regulating menu labeling, nutrition information, portion sizes, and toy giveaways in children's meals. Although these states have laws that prohibit cities and counties from regulating any of these issues, they have no statewide standards, thus creating a regulatory void. And this slide has a lot of text on it. It's an excerpt from one of Mississippi statutes. And I won't read all of it, but I want to highlight a few portions. It expressly prohibits local governments from passing any laws that enact, adopt, or continue in effect local legislation relating to the provision or non-provision of food nutrition information or consumer incentive items, conditioning licenses on the existence or non-existence of food-based health disparities, or the, the broadest provision of all, restricting the sale, distribution, growing, raising, or serving of foods and non-alcoholic beverages that are approved for sale by the U.S. Department of Agriculture or other federal state government agencies. As a result, no city or county in Mississippi may regulate on any of these issues, even though the state has not enacted standards on their own. In this context, vacuum preemption can have some really detrimental effects on public health. Not only does it limit local efforts to address public health issues, such as chronic disease prevention, but it creates a regulatory vacuum by not establishing a statewide standard and thereby prevents policy innovation and diffusion without adding to uniformity. Now that we've established what preemption is and the different forms it can take, how can you identify and track preemption? First, you'll want to look, know and look for some key words and phrases. Next, you'll want to look for a savings clause and to make sure to include one if you're working on a state or federal law. Finally, you'll need to stay alert. As Lindsay will talk about a little bit later, industry often uses less than transparent, if not outright deceptive and misleading tactics to enact preemption. Unfortunately, spotting preemption isn't always as easy as looking for the word preempt. Rather, there are a ton of phrases States and sometimes the federal government uses to preempt lower level laws, and while uh, fairly long, this list is by no means exhaustive. For example, states can require that local laws be consistent with, identical to, no more stringent men, or no more restrictive than state law. And this is just ceiling preemption by any other name. Phrases such as uniform regulation, exclusive authority, matter of statewide concern, occupy the field, 
and sole authority likewise indicate that the state intends to prevent local governments from enacting additional protections. And even if a state law doesn't include any of these terms, courts still sometimes find that a state has impliedly preempted local governments. Spotting implied preemption is very difficult, and you'll definitely want to connect with either the center or us at Change Lab Solutions if you have any questions or concerns about potential implied preemption. And the possibility of implied preemption also makes it important to both check to see whether the laws of a higher level of government has a savings clause that preserves state or local authority, and if you're working on a state or federal law, to make sure that you include a savings clause. A savings clause is a provision in a law where a higher level of government explicitly states that it does not intend to preempt a lower level government. And we'll look at an example of a savings clause in just a few moments. So thus far, we've talked about preemption as a concept and how to spot it. But how has preemption come up in tobacco control? This slide includes an infamous quote from a former tobacco industry executive. It reads that, we could never win at the local level. The reason is all the health advocates may live next door to the mayor or the city councilman, and they say, who's this big time lobbyist coming here to tell us what to do? So the Tobacco Institute and tobacco companies' first priority has always been to preempt the field, preferably to put it all on the federal level, but if they can't do that, at least on the state level, because health advocates can't compete with me on a state level. And this quote really speaks for itself. The tobacco industry has long sought to preempt local authority in tobacco control because they know it's where all of you, advocates and public health professionals, have the most influence. The industry has a much harder time fighting back as well across all of California's 482 municipalities as they can at the state legislature in Sacramento or in Congress in Washington, D.C. And I'm not going to discuss this map in great detail, but I included it simply to illustrate how successful the industry has been in passing preemptive state tobacco laws across the country over the last few decades. And once preemption exists, it's really, really difficult to repeal. It, it's happened before, but the, the instances of it are few and far between. So it's important to make sure that it doesn't exist in the first place. Moving to a specific example of preemption in tobacco control, the Federal Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, commonly referred to as just the Tobacco Control Act, sets a regulatory floor on the minimum legal sales age for tobacco. The law establishes a nationwide minimum legal sales age of 18 for all tobacco products. This ensures baseline standards under which no state or local government can go below. They couldn't, for example, allow tobacco retailers to sell cigarettes to a 16-year-old. However, the federal law explicitly allows states and local governments to enact stricter, stricter requirements, and many, including California, have already done so with Tobacco 21 laws that raise the minimum legal sales age to 21. This slide shows the actual language from the Federal Tobacco Control Act. As you can see, the law includes a preemption clause providing that no state or political subdivision of a state may establish or continue in effect with respect to a tobacco required product any requirement which is different from or in addition to any requirement under the provisions of this subchapter, meaning the Tobacco Control Act, relating to tobacco product standards, pre-market review, adulteration, misbranding, labeling, registration, good manufacturing standards, or modified risk tobacco products. In effect, this provision establishes the federal government as the sole regulator of the manufacturing of tobacco products. However, you can also see the example of a savings clause that I promised earlier. The savings clause carves out an exception to the preemption clause. It explains that the preemption clause does not apply to requirements relating to the sale, distribution, possession, information reporting to the state, exposure to, access to, 
the advertising and promotion of or the use of tobacco products by individuals of any age. So this means that regardless of that preemption language, state and local governments may establish and enforce tobacco control laws relating to those listed areas so long as they are at least as strong as what federal law says. And I mentioned earlier that California has fairly broad local authority generally, and that is true for tobacco control as well. But that authority isn't absolute. Some California state laws do establish floor or even ceiling preemption on certain types of tobacco control measures. For example, the California Smoke-Free Workplace Law preempts local governments from regulating smoking in locations in which state law already prohibits smoking. But it also includes a saving clause, and this is really important, that allows local regulation of smoking in any location where the state smoke-free workplace law does not apply. The state, in essence, is creating a regulatory floor. In contrast, state law establishes a regulatory ceiling with respect to tobacco taxes. No local government in California can impose taxes on tobacco products beyond those that are imposed by state law. And tobacco-related preemption in California is really quite minimal compared to other states. And this has allowed tobacco control efforts in California to thrive. In South Dakota, for example, state law prohibits local governments from enacting any laws whatsoever related to the distribution, marketing, promotion, and sale of tobacco products. This effectively outlaws local governments from regulating any aspect of the tobacco retail environment including policies common in California, such as tobacco retailer licensing, restrictions on menthol and flavored tobacco products, and pricing-related policies like minimum package sizes and prohibitions on the redemption of tobacco coupons and discounts. And before I turn things over to Lindsay, I want to end by noting that preemption is really an opportunity for people from all kinds of fields, public health, civil rights, economic justice, among others, to come together to protect, to protect equitable local innovation. If we work together across our issue silos, we can harness preemption as a tool to organize for the advancement of healthier and more just communities. And with that, I will turn things over to Lindsay. Thank you, Derek. Hello, everybody. I am Lindsay Freitas. I'm Senior Director of Advocacy and the Project Director for the Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing, which is here at the American Lung Association. Um, and before I jump into just some current um, events around preemption, I just want to take a moment and say the Center for Tobacco Policy and Organizing is here to support all of the local work that you guys are doing whether it's on the policy side or the organizing side. So please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us on the team here. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have. So with that said, I, before I jump into my next slide, I want to make sure everyone uh, really focuses in on a couple of key points that Derek talked about. And the first is that uh, not having those strong preemption clauses here in California is really, really important for the work that we have been doing here in California. As he mentioned, a lot of our local efforts really start with you guys before they percolate up to the state level. And we would not have seen the real strong movement in tobacco control that we've seen if we weren't allowed to do that. So we really need to make sure that we protect our ability to continue to pass these local policies. And it might seem funny to everybody that we're here having this call with everybody because why is this an issue? If California has these policies in place and lets local governments adopt these policies, then we're fine, right? And unfortunately, we've seen an uptick recently in efforts by the tobacco industry to really get at that issue in response to a lot of the work being done around flavors around the country. So you know, most, one of the more recent examples occurred in Pennsylvania. And just to provide a little bit of context and history of uh, Pennsylvania, since I think most of the folks on the call are from California, 
uh, Pennsylvania has, is where Philadelphia is. And Philadelphia is really uh, the main city in Pennsylvania that's been adopting a lot of tobacco control policies. They've really been doing a lot of work there and moving things and doing a lot of really valuable work. A lot of the other communities in Pennsylvania are not allowed to for a number of reasons, um, most of which are the reasons we've been discussing on this call. There's also a, a little bit of tension between the city of Philadelphia and the state capitol in Harrisburg. Those uh, legislators that represent the state feel like uh, Philadelphia is you know, a strain on the state budget system, that they're always having to fill these gaps in funding for education for them. And conversely, the uh, city council in Philadelphia feels that they are always at odds with the state, that they're providing a lot of extra funding and not getting a lot of it back. And so there's, there's some tensions inherent there. And then recently, as I mentioned, Philadelphia started considering um, a new and amazing tobacco control policy. They were looking at regulating the sale of flavored tobacco products within the city. And this really got the tobacco industry up in arms. And they managed to get a proposal stuck into the state budget process at the very, very end with just a couple of days left before that budget had to be signed. And without any opportunity for public comment or a public airing that this was actually in there. And um, what this provision, what they were seeking at the time was to prohibit all tobacco control, Philadelphia from passing all tobacco control policies. Uh, they really wanted to stop Philadelphia's previously passed policies as well. So they didn't want anything that they had done previously to be held true. But the folks that were working on this issue at the state capitol really um, applauded themselves for finding a middle ground. And that middle ground to them was they can keep everything they've done up until now, but they're not allowed to do anything moving forward. And so with the passage of that budget, Philadelphia is no longer able to adopt any tobacco control policies. So that's a really big deal. Um, so let's dig in a little bit and see why that kind of happened and the tactics that the industry used. So the first thing to highlight is the industry really fed on these tensions that were already existing between the city and the state. They knew that these legislators were already kind of unsure about what Philadelphia was doing and had made previous attempts to preempt Philadelphia from being able to do things in other areas. They'd taken over their school system, their parking authority, and things like that. So the industry really fed on that. The next tactic that the industry used and that they have been using for a long time is waiting until the very last minute. So they waited until they had an opportunity to work behind the scenes without a lot of input, without public knowledge to get something inserted into this budget process. And so they really were strategic in the timing at which they got this put in. And then finally, the other really important tactic that they used was that they snuck it into a bill that was already really necessary. They snuck it into the budget. And um, similarly to many other states, there are legal requirements upon which legislatures need to approve these budgets in order to get the money out the door. And so um, there really was no way to not approve this. If you didn't approve this provision, then you didn't approve the entire budget, and that would create a whole host of other consequences that these legislators just couldn't deal with. They, they couldn't withstand it. And so the tobacco industry really was key in, and strategic in how they put that in. So ultimately, it was passed. And you know, similarly to what Derek was saying, um, the tobacco industry has spent $3.3 million in the capital in Pennsylvania lobbying the legislature over the last five years on tobacco issues. So $3.3 million. And that's where they want to fight it. That's where they've got the influence. Um, one of the articles, I've, I've quoted a couple of articles here, but one of the articles discussing this issue in Pennsylvania likened it to the industry deciding that they were tired of playing whack-a-mole and ta tackling this issue in each city, so they just covered the entire board with 
a piece of plywood and tamped it all down. And that was their goal, and that's what they did. And so that was just uh, earlier this year in um, Pennsylvania. Another interesting um, one for us to explore is what happened in Hawaii. Hawaii similarly um, had a bill that had been going through the legislative process that would have dealt with kidney dialysis centers, um, which is an important issue. They were having a lot of problems around that, and this was a bill that had a lot of support and would have really had strong public health benefits. And so it was a, it was a very important bill. And at the last minute, the tobacco industry managed to get a provision added to the bill behind closed doors and without any opportunity for public comment that prohibits the ability of local governments to enact tobacco control legislation. So it's very similar to what we saw in Philadelphia in that they, they picked a strategic bill that they knew the governor could not veto. If he had vetoed that bill, many people would have suffered. They really needed this kidney dialysis bill. Um, and then they waited until the very last minute that they could and snuck it in there before there was any opportunity for public comment. So we did see the tobacco industry again using the same tactics that we saw them use in Philadelphia and that we've seen them use historically, strategically picking these pieces of legislation that are not easy to kill, strategically waiting until the timing of these things happens so that there's no opportunity to mobilize the community and let them really push back that this can't happen. And for that reason, we saw Hawaii also adopt this policy. Now, I just want to say that it's not all losses happening out there. There have been a couple instances in South Carolina and Georgia where we've had these assaults from the industry and we have been able to push back on them. And so there is hope, but we do need to maintain our awareness on this issue. And one of the reasons we need to be especially concerned on this here in California is because of recent events here in California that involve the soda industry. And I'm not sure how tuned in folks have been to this, but um, the soda industry kind of took the playbook of big tobacco and then tweaked it a little and got it even more effective. The soda industry just this past year spent $7 million to get an initiative on the ballot which would have been on this upcoming November's ballot that would have preempted local communities from raising taxes without a two-thirds vote, any taxes, not tobacco taxes, not soda taxes. Any tax would now require a two-third vote under the passage of this initiative. This would have made it incredibly difficult for local governments to adopt these taxes because a two-thirds vote is a very high bar. And this proposal was not well liked by legislators, by city governments, by county governments, by every issue area out there. It impacted everything because it was such a blanket um, policy that covered so much. And so they collected all the signatures they needed to get this qualified for the ballot. And just before the deadline to withdraw the initiative and take it off the ballot, they went to the legislature and said, hey, you guys, we want to make a deal. And their proposal was, we will pull this initiative that everybody hates if you pass a bill that preempts local soda and snack taxes. So you won't get those taxes, but you can do all the other taxes you want and we'll pull this out. And the soda industry can do this because they, similarly to the tobacco industry, have a lot of money. And unfortunately, the legislature really felt like it was being held hostage. It felt like it could not allow this initiative to move forward and inhibit the ability of local governments to raise taxes in the ways that they felt that local governments needed. So they made the deal. They managed to walk it back just a little bit. They managed to ensure that that policy only was in existence for 12 years. But unfortunately, the outcome was that the legislature approved a bill that prohibits soda and snack taxes for a total of 12 years, and it was signed into law. That uh, one legislature, legislator 
basically said that he felt held hostage. And it was a sad day in the Capitol. A lot of uh, folks were very upset about that. And what's so interesting about this tactic is it's, you, it's capitalizing on the other ways that the tobacco industry has gotten preemption passed in these other communities. It's waited till the last minute and been very strategic about the timing and, and picked a, a vehicle to carry something forward. In this case, they, they decided to kind of use this initiative vehicle as leverage, not necessarily a vehicle to get it passed. Um, but they did use this different tactic that, they, that we haven't seen before, which is they basically threatened the legislature with this big initiative, which would have been worse. And the legislature really had to choose the lesser of two evils. And so they chose to put in place the soda tax. Now I can tell you that there have already been um, efforts underway to put an initiative on the ballot that would undo that. But unfortunately, the fear is that the soda industry has now taken the tobacco industry's game plan, really improved upon it, and now the tobacco industry has a whole new playbook that they can use. And so we really need to be careful about that. The, in California, we've seen a huge uptick in local communities seeking to address flavored tobacco policies. And the industry, like I said, doesn't want to play whack-a-mole all over the state. They really want to fight at once at the Capitol. So we really need to be careful that they don't try the same thing that the soda industry do, did here in California. To put it into perspective, in Pennsylvania, I mentioned that the tobacco industry spent $3.3 million in the last five years. Well, in California, the industry spent $12.9 million. That's four times as much. So we really need to be on alert and be aware that this is something that could happen here in California. So how do we be on alert? How do we look for it? I mean, Derek gave us some really good tips on what to look for, what language to look for. And what I can tell you is that your counterparts at the voluntary health organizations are on high alert for this and are looking at um, watching things very, very closely. But what we do won't matter if the folks at the local level aren't ready to act. And so we really need everybody ready and prepared to act. I think everybody on this webinar today is taking that first step and becoming educated and aware of the issue. And that's what we need. We need to make sure that everybody in the community is educated and aware of what's going on. You can share this webinar once you get the link. You can call uh, the Center or Change Lab anytime you have a question, anytime you have a concern. We will come and help um, educate your community members and your coalition so that they're ready as well. And the key to getting ready is that once you're ready, you've heard these things happen very on very short notice at the last minute. That's why we need everybody to be ready so your coalitions are prepped. And then they can send letters and call their decision makers. So those are the key steps that we need folks ready to do. The Lung Association is working on putting together some template letters that coalitions or individual community members can use. We'll provide talking points and let folks know what to do and when to do it. Unfortunately, those materials can't go out until we have a better sense of what we're dealing with, which just means that everybody needs to be ready and prepared to act on very, very short notice. So pay attention to any emails you might have from us or any conversations that might be going on, and let us know how and where we can be of help for you guys. I think that the preemption issue is something that we've not had to worry about in California for a while but it's time for us to really start paying attention to it again and make sure that this doesn't happen here. The soda industry won earlier this year. We can't let big tobacco win. We can't, and we need all of your help to do it. So with that, I will turn it back over to Pratima for questions and answers. Thanks so much to both Derek and Lindsay for their extremely informative presentations. So as Lindsay just mentioned, we've now come to the Q&A portion of today's webinar, and we actually have quite a bit of time reserved for discussion. Um, if you haven't done so already, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. If we run out of time, we'll be sure to respond to your question via email. So feel free to type those questions in. Thanks. So our first question
question in the queue relates to flavor policy. And the question reads, um, opponents sometimes argue that federal law preempts menthol restrictions. Is that true? Derek, would you like to speak to that question? Sure. Uh, thanks, Keenan. Thank you for the question. Um, it is an argument that we often hear a lot, and, and I'm sure Lindsay can, can attest to, um, since she's closer to, to the folks on, on the ground um, with all of you. And the, the short answer is, is no, it, it doesn't. Um, and we, we know that not just because of the, the savings clause um, that we talked about earlier um, that's in the Tobacco Control Act, but we actually have federal court decisions specifically addressing the issue. Uh, New York City, Providence, Rhode Island, and Chicago all passed flavor policies um, fairly early, um, fairly early on in the early 2010s. Um, and each of the, in each of those instances, the, the tobacco industry brought challenges, and in each of those instances, the tobacco industry lost. Um, you know, both the, the New York City and Providence cases, while they didn't involve menthol specifically, because menthol was excluded from those policies. Um, they did involve restrictions on the sale of flavored tobacco products. And the, the courts, uh, federal appellate courts, so just below the level of the Supreme Court, were unequivocal in saying that the Federal Tobacco Control Act protects the authority of state and local governments to impose additional sales restrictions and prohibitions to protect the public health and well-being of their citizens. And so it doesn't really get much more emphatic than that. Normally court decisions are you know, this little bit of, of wishy-washy analyzing both sides, and, and in this instance they were, they were pretty straight on clear saying that, that this is well um, squarely within the authority. And then in Chicago, um, that wasn't an appellate court. That was only in the, the district court, um, but it did include menthol. They had a uh, buffer zone around schools, and the uh, conglomerate of, of convenience scores brought a challenge, and they lost as well. Um, you know, the court basically agreed with the, the courts that addressed the New York and Providence decision, saying that, you know, this is, is squarely within it. Congress clearly intended to allow um, state and local governments to pass additional protections, and and so while well, it's it's you know as a lawyer I have to say that there's no certainty in in predicting how courts go, um, and there's no certainty in whether the tobacco industry will will try to challenge it. You know we saw their tactics in San Francisco with the uh, initiative referendum campaign, um, but all signs point to that it would not be a, a fair fight, and for once. Uh, Public health would have the easy side of that that argument. Um, so, the, the, again, the, the short answer is no. Local governments and, and the state government itself um, can prohibit menthol, and um, we should all continue working towards those policies. Great, thanks so much, Derek. Um, we're just waiting to see if uh, additional folks from the field have questions. Please feel free to type those questions in the chat box. So a question just came through that I'm going to direct to Lindsay. It says, we have a close relationship with a field rep for a tobacco champion in the state senate. We can educate them about preemption, but is it inappropriate to ask that they give us a heads up if they hear of any preemption talk in the senate? That is a great question, and I think that that's a great opportunity for you to build that relationship even more, and sometimes that's how we hear about these things. So I think if you feel comfortable doing that, then by all means, please uh, ask them that. And my only recommendation would be once you start having those conversations or if there is a bill that's actually under dis uh, consideration, please just shoot those over to um, either me at the Lung Association or Tim Gibbs with the Cancer Society because um, we don't want you guys crossing any lines on uh, the lobbying versus educating, but I think that if you get a heads up, that's definitely an okay situation. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Our next question that came through says, I'm concerned about lobbying or um, excuse me, I'm concerned about local decision makers' perception of indirect lobbying by DPH subcontractors. How do we protect our campaigns? I'm going to turn this one over to Derek. So I'm going to give the, the very lawyerly answer by not answering this question. Um, that's a, 
it's an important question, and um, you know, the lobbying rules are, are certainly complex. My uh, recommendations for that would be to reach out to your uh, CTCP um, project group managers um, and CTCB themselves, um, they have lots of guidance around, uh, you know, the limitations on, on what you're allowed to do with their, their state funding. I know there are some resources on partners as well. Um, and if there are those questions come up, um, reaching out to them when they do. Um, and also, you know, relying on folks like Lindsay and uh, Tim Gibbs, as she mentioned, from cancer and, and the voluntaries that, um, you know, Lindsay, and obviously in her role at the center, doesn't lobby, but the American Lung Association and Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network, um, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, they all, they all do do lobby. And so um, when those things come up, it's a, it's a matter of just making sure that you have open lines of communications with the, the state to, to make sure you're not crossing any lines and relying on um, the partners to to kind of fill in that last um, mile um, of, of what does actually constitute lobbying. Lindsay, did you want to add anything anything to that? Sure, um, and I, I echo what Derek said, and I think it's always best to get the final answer from your CTCP um, project, project managers and get some guidance from them. Um, I also think that if you're the idea of educating legislators about issues is different than lobbying them on issues, and that's something we um, have a lot of trainings on and do some training around for our INE Day event. And so, if you um, first line of defense is calling CTCP, but if you have any other questions about, you know, um, what is happening at the Capitol, and you know, if I have advice on what where it might be getting too close to the line, given my knowledge about bills that are going on, I'm happy to answer those questions. Great. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Any other of our participants have any questions, please feel free to chat them in the chat box at the lower left corner of your screen. We'll just pause for another minute or so to see if folks add any additional questions. And one thing, this is Lindsay, that I'd like to add for everybody is that um, you know, as we've learned from recent events, the industry is not going to give us a heads up that this is happening. It's going to happen very quickly. And so we just need to be prepared beforehand. And so the first line of defense is educating ourselves against it. So thank you all for being on this call. So it looks like we haven't received any additional questions through the chat box, but please know um, that you can always reach out to any of us for questions. Our email addresses are up on the screen right now, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, we also hope that you'll take the next minute or two to complete our webinar evaluation. It should pop up on the screen just after the webinar ends. So again, thanks so much for your time and participation today. Have a great day.